Thanks, Martin. Here's what I know. To decide to live life as a follower and friend of Jesus is the best decision anyone can ever make. To follow Jesus is about all of our lives. It's everything we do, everything we say. It's all we hope for, all we invest in. It's how we raise our children. It's how we live our life together. It's what we can be sure of and what we can hope for. As Harriet says, it remaps our lives. And for loads of us here, this faith defines our lives, doesn't it? And the one thing we want for our friends and our family, our work colleagues, our neighbours, is that they themselves become followers of Jesus. It would be so brilliant if my friends who don't know the love of Christ turn and become friends of Jesus. Think for a moment of somebody you know in your family, friends, someone you work with, someone who's a neighbour of yours, someone you know who needs this good news How different their life would be if they knew it. How does that happen, though? A friend of mine, a few months ago, had puppies. I mean, they didn't have puppies. Their dog had puppies. The dog was pregnant for a while, but they just came down in the morning, and the puppies were there. Like, how does that happen? If there's a vet here, could you tell me afterwards how animals can just give birth on their own? However, humans don't give birth on their own. We need people around us who help bring birth to life. The same is true, I believe, of our birth as children of God. I heard a bishop this week say, that it's only God who can bring life and growth. And of course, on one level, she is right. But how do we think God does that? Let's listen to some scriptures. Uh, Scriptures from Acts chapter 1. Sarah's going to come and read it for us at the beginning of the first chapter of Acts. Uh, So listen in. Acts 1, um, verses 1 to 9. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Brilliant, Sarah. Thanks ever so much. Let's pray. Lord God, we need you so much. Our lives are barren without you, uh, like the desert wasteland. So come and speak your word to us. Come and bring your presence to us through your words to us. Uh, Challenge us. Open our lives up once again to what it is that you want for us and what it is you want to give us. In Jesus' name, amen. These are Jesus' final words. He's doing two things. He's giving his followers a task, and he's promising them something. The task they're given is to be witnesses, and the promise they're given is the Holy Spirit. 
throughout Scripture, whenever God gives a command or task, he always gives a promise to. And this is a really brilliant one. So in Acts 1.8, Jesus says this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. This is the task, to be a witness of Jesus. Now, we know Christian faith doesn't begin and end with us. It's not about us. It's not about our ability, our morality, our our background, how good we are at praying or anything like that. It's about Jesus. If you're a Christian, think of what you have witnessed yourself firsthand from Jesus. We've encountered Jesus through stories of him, through his words, through the care and help of other people, through worshiping him, him, through praying to him, through experiences where we've read a story in scripture and that story has come to life for us because we've reached out and touched the hem of his garment and he has stopped the whole world and called us by name. He's come as a shepherd to find us when we were lost. He's put us on his shoulders. He's taken our burdens. And we've been in the presence of one who has known us fully and yet has completely loved us. We've encountered his love and his forgiveness. As we learn of the suffering and pain that he went through, we ourselves have found that he's with us in our suffering and pain. But more than that, that in this death, is our death. He's died for us. He's borne our sin. There's forgiveness that is possible because of it. And three days later, he's proclaimed to be alive and not resuscitated or just like returning to how old life was, but new life, the life of the future, resurrection life. And in that, death is overthrown. And that we know that with this Jesus, we're never alone. He promises always to be with us. And our lives as Christians are primarily about this Jesus. They're not about ourselves. Because on Jesus, we can be sure and certain. Not of ourselves, but we can be sure and certain of Jesus. His map is true. As Revelation says, Jesus is the faithful and true witness. This is God. And God is honest and true. And so there is something I think that we just need to lean on, that the good news is such good news. Around culture at the moment, there's an astonishing kind of turning and eye-opening about God. Uh, There's a guy called Martin Shaw, who's a mythologist who rejected the Christian faith, who went on a 102-day retreat in the woods by himself. On day 101, the Lord revealed himself to him. Uh, We know the historian Tom Holland now is a confessional Christian, saying that he understands that Christianity is the one that makes sense of all things. Uh, Nick Cave, uh, an artist, musician. Uh, You probably might not care for his music. He's just come out with an album called Wild God. On that album is the the title Conversion, a track called Conversion. His son Arthur took his life in 2015. And Nick Cave has written astonishingly about prayer and about suffering. In this book he says, the whole of life is about seeking absolution, forgiveness for sins. And no one else is talking about it because no one else can offer it except Christianity. You see, I think to call Christianity good news is a classic understatement. Like it's brilliant news. Do you know how good it is? Forgiveness and peace, belonging, identity, someone to, someone to be participate in. Forgiveness, hope. We're never alone. And not only is this good news for us, but it's good news for every single person. This is for everybody. Everybody's invited. No one's left out. Because God has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He saved the world. There's no one who who Jesus wants to be outside of that. He wants everybody on the inside of that. And we know people who are on the outside at the moment. 
On Friday, I came back from work uh, really annoyed. I, I, I work at Lambeth Palace, but it's a building site, so I work over the road in Church House, and I'd been on Church House on my, on my own for the whole day. I came back, and I bumped into somebody as I was walking in through the door about six o'clock, and I said, oh, what, how come you're here? Because they were a visitor. And they said, oh, we've just come to this lecture that this guy, Andrew Rumsey, has given. I was like, what, here? He said, yeah. Like, Andrew Rumsey was my best man. <laughs> I'm like... So I went back and I said to Belinda, I can't believe, I was really angry, I said, I can't believe it, how come he was doing this? And she said, why did you not go? I said, because no one told me. The only way we know anything is because someone tells us. How are people going to know this good news? Or oh, because someone tells them. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Now, if there are some teachers, you can help me with my grammar. I would, I'm terrible at grammar. But my understanding when Jesus says, you will be my witnesses, is he's not using a verb. He's not saying, Marcus, you will occasionally witness. You will do some witnessing. He's using a noun, which I think describes who we are. We are witnesses. We don't get to choose whether we should be witnesses or whether we feel good enough to be witnesses. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. He's describing who we are. The question isn't whether you want to be a witness or not. You are, if you're a Christian. The question is whether we're going to be faithful witnesses or not. Now, it, the word gospel comes from the word evangel which means a good messenger, angels in there, right? Somebody who speaks the good news. There are evangelists. There are some evangelists here, right? So, so Jack Lazell is an evangelist. He can talk about Jesus without giving people whiplash. Like it's like the car's in third gear and some people who aren't evangelists who when they think they've got to introduce the Christian faith guy and take it into reverse. An evangelist can speak the good news of Jesus in a compelling and challenging way, in a way that really, like, they've clearly got a gift to do that. Not all of us are evangelists, but we are all witnesses. An evangelist is, if you like, a barrister in a court of law. They're making the case for it. They're arguing the point. They're driving it to a particular conclusion. A witness doesn't do that, do they? A witness simply says what they know, says what they've seen, says what they've experienced. We are all witnesses because we're witnesses of what Jesus has done for us and then we witness to that to other people. This is our primary calling as Christians to be witnesses. This is why we sing because we witness together to who God is and what God's done for us. And this is how we live our lives as witnesses. What do we need to be witnesses? Should we go on a course? Should we learn some answers to those really tough questions that people are going to ask us? I mean, those might be helpful, but that's not what we need to be a witness. From the passage, what do we need to be a witness? We need the empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the life that Jesus had in him in us so we can be faithful witnesses. You see, to fulfill your calling as a witness, you don't have to be like Marcus or like Yaz. You don't have to be like them. You have to be you. Because you can witness in a way that nobody else can. But what you need is you need the promised Holy Spirit so you can be faithful to what you yourself have experienced about God. This is why Johnny is absolutely right. All of our life for God, trying to reach people and speak to people about the Christian faith and witness for people begins with prayer. Begins with praying, come Holy Spirit. Come, come on me that I can live faithfully as a witness and come on these people I'm with and open their lives up that they might understand your love for them and respond to it. The day before the conclave in 2013, which chose Pope Francis, 
Georges Bergoglio, as he was then, a cardinal from Buenos Aires, uh, stood up in front of the Co College of Cardinals and he said, Jesus is knocking on the door of the church, asking to be let out. Uh, and I believe Jesus is out there. And how does Jesus work? Th this is the astonishing thing, friends. He chooses to work through these lives, through us. We know our lives aren't ideal, but Jesus chooses to work through us to witness to him. This is why prayer is so vital. Now, uh, there are lots of things I pray that um, I I'm puzzled why they don't come to pass. The one prayer that Jesus always answers, right, is the prayer, Lord, give me an opportunity to witness for you this week. Or always. Or usually with lights on it and flashing like, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Now, I'm not great at this. The most obvious example of this was when I, had, I thought I had tonsillitis. So I had tonsillitis. My throat was killing me a few years ago. So I, I phoned the doctor, said, I, I've got tonsillitis. Can I come in? They're like, no one has tonsillitis, but you can. So I went in. I said to the doctor, what's wrong? He, he said, what's wrong? I said, I've got tonsillitis. He said, no one has tonsillitis. He asked me to open my mouth. He said, you've got tonsillitis. <laughs> so then he gave me like a prescription for some antibiotics. I was just about to leave, and he said, oh, I see on your medical records, the Reverend Russell, that you're a vicar. I was like, yeah, I've got tonsillitis. <laughs> it's like, I'm, he said, I grew up in South Africa. It was a very religious country, and lots of my friends were Christians, but I never went to church myself. And I've always been trying to make sense of what God is doing. It's like, I've, I've got tonsillitis. <laughs> I, I think I said something, I think there's a church opposite. Uh, I was rubbish. But what I do know is that God continues to give me opportunities. Every time I pray, God gives me an opportunity. And so one of the things we're going to do in a few moments is I'm going to ask you to be courageous enough to pray with me that you would have an opportunity this week to be a witness for Jesus. To simply say what you know, to simply say what you've experienced when the opportunity makes itself clear to you. Obviously, the problem is, as the American theologian last century, Reinhold Niebuhr, says, is that why is it that most Christians live lives like those celebrities who are endorsing products you know they're not using themselves? that I want to live my life as a witness, but, but I'm really bad witness. W what about that? The thing is, I think a witness can live honestly because it's not about you. It's about who you understand and who you've experienced Jesus to be. I think as a witness, we can share our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses. In March 2020, when lockdown happened, um, I was a vicar of a church in Reading. And uh, at the end of March, do you remember, like, this thing that none of us had any comprehension what it was going to feel like? I, I thought it would last about kind of 15 days or something like that. Um, and we started praying together as a church online at St. Lawrence. A and for the first few days, I, I'd I invited people to give, um, to choose a scripture reading and then to share a story with people about what God had done for them. The first couple of days were like, oh, this happened, and then a miracle happened, and it was amazing, and it was, like, great. But after about four or five days, people started saying, I went through this, and it was really hard. I, I was really disillusioned with myself, or this prayer wasn't answered, or I had to keep going through the pain of it, or this person died. But do you know, within it all, this is what I experienced of God. God never left me. He was with me every step. In fact, he was with me closer in the hard times than he was. I felt him in the good times. You see, our witness in the face of death. What else has anyone got to say in the face of death other than us? What other hope is there? But we can stand by the side of a grave and proclaim the resurrection of the dead. 
Proclaim the suffering one who journeys through the valley of the shadow of death with us. You see, as witnesses, we don't have to kind of have airbrushed lives or have ideal lives. It's these lives that he uses as his faithful witnesses. And that's what each of us can do. But loads of my friends talk to me about the outside church, talk to me about the problems within church and the problems with Christianity. I say, listen, I'm under no illusions of how hard it is. I can tell you more problems in the church than you could even dream of. But you tell me of what brings meaning to your life. And I'll tell you about Jesus and the difference he makes. Today is a day when we consider who we might invite to come along to Alpha. We've talked a moment ago about the difference between an evangelist and witness. The church is an evangelist because the church reaches out with the good news. And it's brilliant we do Alpha because what it does is it means that I don't have to get my friends from like zero or like actually minus 70 to become Christians and then to teach them about the faith. It means all I need to do is to say, come and see. Because the church, I think, is the best place for evangelism to happen. The local church where people know your names, where you can make friends, where you can, over a period of time, explore this. And that's what we do as witnesses. We simply need to say, come and see. I've experienced this to be true, and I believe this can be true for you because often we won't say it is like you have no idea how much God loves you or what his love would do in your lives. So this week, let us look for opportunities after we've prayed in a moment that we might witness. And let's pray to the Lord that particular people would come across our path that we can say, this is what I know is true. Why don't you come and find out for yourself? I often wonder why God employs such a high-risk strategy, like using us. But of course, the God of the incarnation, the God of Jesus, the God of relationship is always going to pass on the faith from one person to another. God brings people across our path so we can be witnesses. Let us pray for opportunities this week, pray for the courage to take them, and particularly pray now that the Spirit would fill us so we can be faithful to everything we know Jesus is. If you could and are able, please will you stand? So I wonder if you can bring to mind somebody that you know, that you're, you see in their lives just how they need the love of God, the presence of God, the hope of God. Lord, we are so aware of how much this world needs saving. And we are so grateful for what you have done for us in Jesus. We pray that you would give us opportunities this week to witness to you through our words, through our actions. And we don't feel up to that. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and live your life in us. Uh, that we would see the joy of people who we witness to themselves becoming witnesses of your love. Come Holy Spirit, give us what we most need, your presence.